Hallelujah. Today we get to look at a great passage in John chapter 11. If you have your journals or your Bible, you can turn to John chapter 11. It's here that we hear a rather well-known story, but this is a historical event. This is not just make-believe. This isn't fictitious. This is a real event that happened to real people. This is a Hollywood story. This is one that could be in the movies. There's a lot of great characters in the story. You've got Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. You have Lazarus himself, the disciples who are with him, the crowd who is with Mary and Martha. You have the Jews who are kind of on the outskirts. You have this guy named Caiaphas, who's uh, one of the high priests. And in this story, you get a crisis. There's sorrow. There's shock. There's disbelief. There's confusion. There's people who are skeptical, people who have questions. There's people who are hostile and angry and mad. But what's amazing is Jesus responds to each of these people in an amazing way. Jesus responds to each of them in three ways. One, he declares glorious truth. He speaks glorious truth. Number two, he responds with deep emotion. He has emotion for the events that are taking place. And then number three, he responds with powerful action. Jesus isn't just one of words, but he's one of demonstration and power and powerful action. So in John chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, you get the setting of the story that Jesus is off away. He's about 12 miles from uh, where this story is taking place. Mary and Martha are there with Lazarus, and Lazarus is ill. So Mary and Martha, they send somebody to go tell Jesus that he's ill. When, when there's a crisis, who do we run to? We run to Jesus. And so to Mary and Martha, there is a crisis. They saw that his brother was ill and probably in his last days. Who knows? Maybe he was gasping for breath. But they send for Jesus. And they send a messenger and they say, Lord, he whom you love is ill. He's reminding them that Jesus, you love Lazarus. And this word love is spelled out throughout the whole entire Bible. I love the word love. Jesus loves us. He loves us unconditionally. No matter what happens in life, he loves us. And so Mary and Martha, they send and they say, he whom you love is ill. Well, then in verse 4, Jesus responds and he says this truth. He says, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man, God may be glorified through it. This word glory is emphasized twice here in this verse. You can circle the word glory. I love the word glory. God loves to manifest his glory on us. We receive God's glory, and then we as children of God have opportunity to give God glory. But this phrase here is rather shocking. You see, he says this phrase, this illness does not lead to death. But as we just heard uh, demonstrated by Abby, she did a great job, by the way, didn't she? I mean, I think we need to give Abby a little clap. But the fact is, is that Lazarus did die. Here you got a statement by Jesus this illness does not lead to death. But then if you read on, he died. He died. And yes, you can skip ahead and, and he was resurrected. But then of all things, Lazarus has to go through death not just once, but twice. This guy dies twice. But this is a true statement nonetheless. This illness does not lead to death. 
It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Here's the reality. Number one is that for those who are in Christ, we never face death. Yes, we die in the natural, but those who follow Jesus never die in the supernatural. We go from life here on earth to life eternally. This word death is uh, a theme throughout this whole chapter. Twelve times it's mentioned in chapter 11, the dead and, and dying. And the reality is that every single person on earth will die. Everybody. I was sitting back here, and I was kneeling on the ground because God told me to, and I noticed the dust on the ground, and I just touched the dust, and God was just reminding me, that's where you're going. Nobody knows their last days. Nobody knows how long it will be. One of my mentors in seminary, Dr. Huffman, He lost a daughter at an early age to leukemia. And I admired Dr. Huffman because he he asked a lot of questions and he was real with it. He said, I don't know why my daughter died at an early age. I don't know. I, I, I can't figure it out. I have a lot of questions even to this day. But one thing I do know is that God is good and that he loves me. And then he said this statement, it's always stuck with me. He said, age is just relative. Nobody knows how long they're going to live. And he said, each one of us is one day closer to our last. Nobody knows. This is why I love having these rocks. If you've noticed, we have these rocks, this nice vase. In our entrance, as people come into church, these rocks are up on the little tables there. And on these rocks are names. Chris, Jenna, Paul, Allison. In these rocks, we had people write down people's names of people who do not know Jesus. These are all Look at this. This is full of people. And I know we could all add many more to this. But I love it that they're on rocks because you know what rocks do when you let them go? They drop. And the reality is, one day, Allison will die. But, If Allison chooses to believe in Jesus, even though she dies, yet shall she live. But she has to believe in Jesus. It grips me. These rocks rocks grip me every time I go in because I realize I go in and I'm joined with lots of people who have believed Some come in and they have not yet believed. But as I go out every day, I want to go after these people. Death is a reality. He says this death, this illness does not lead to death, but it is for the glory of God. Here's the key. In every circumstance, no matter what life brings, You can receive God's glory, and you can give God glory. How many of you believe that? Here's the thing. They they didn't know what was coming when he said this. But they believed, and they, they had opportunity to receive God's glory and to give God glory. Let's go on. The next verse in verse 5 says this. It makes it very clear. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. Jesus loved them. He loved each of them. But then the next verse is actually really shocking. It says, So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. 
here you got on one side, Jesus loves Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, but then on the other side, he stays for two extra days. Now, this is at the end of Jesus' life. He is a miracle-working God. He has healed people, lame people. He's resurrected other people. He's healed people from a distance. He could have, at that moment, just said, Lazarus, you're healed. But it says he loved them, and then it says he stayed two extra days. Now, here's the truth. The truth is that God's love is not dependent upon our circumstances. Each of us need to know this. God doesn't love you more when you get a promotion, and he doesn't love you less when you get fired. God doesn't love you more when, you're, when your child gets healed of leukemia or when your child is taken by leukemia. God loves you no matter what. I've been encouraged by Brad and Tina Re Reynolds recently. Brad and Tina had a daughter named Alyssa. Brad and Tina were missionaries. I mean, they gave their life for the Lord. Their entire life they gave to God. Well, recently, uh, it was several years ago, their daughter was pronounced with cancer. And it would take a miracle. Well, at the beginning of this cancer, God gave Brad Reynolds the verse, John 11, verse 4. And the verse is, this sickness does not lead to death, but it is for the glory of God. So Brad was praying this verse and rallying others. I was one of them. I was praying. Up until the day she died, I was praying this verse. I said, this sickness does not lead to death. And I was thinking it was in the natural, and we were praying for Alyssa's life. Well, Alyssa died on May 14, 2021. She died at 38 years old. This isn't supposed to happen. Here's a guy who gives his life serving God and has spent years apart from his daughter. And his daughter's taken way too early. Just this past week, I called Brad, and I was a little nervous when I called him. I said, Brad, what about that verse, John eleven four, 4, that you had us praying? This sickness does not lead to death. And I was a little nervous because I thought I might be bringing up a sore subject here. Like, this could bring up a lot of anger. Well, Brad responded, and he said, oh, Stephen, I've held on to that verse. That verse is more true to me now than ever before. He said, on the day that she died, I received a text from one of my best friends. And the text said, Brad, I've been praying that verse, John 11, 4, over you. And God has led me to text you to assure Brad that Alyssa is alive with me now. Alyssa is more alive than she ever was before. Brad, Alyssa knows him and is loved by him and has been received by him. She is now seeing the glory we so longed and prayed that she would see. What a testimony. Brad allowed me to share this, and he continues to want to give God glory. Glory in Alyssa's life and glory in Alyssa's eternal life. Life is not always easy, but God loves us no matter what. There's a saying that we used to say as a phrase, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. I want to just switch it up a little bit here and have you repeat. I want to say, Jesus loves you all the time. All the time, Jesus loves you. Can we do that? Jesus loves you all the time. Receive it. Receive his steadfast love, Romans 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now, we have questions, and this story goes on, and the people in this story are real. They have lots of questions. They have lots of questions. Verse 7, uh, Jesus says, let us go to Judea again. 
uh, verse 8, his disciples are like, uh, they're trying to kill you in Judea. We better not go there. Uh, Jesus then says, Lazarus has fallen asleep. His disciples here in verse uh, 14, uh, verse 12, his disciples thought, oh, if he's only sleeping, he's going to recover. And then verse 14, Jesus just had to tell them straight up, Lazarus has died. He's dead. He just had to make it clear to him. Then verse 16, Thomas replies, and this is an amazing statement. Thomas says, let us go so that we may die with him. What a statement. Dear Thomas. Uh, see, Thomas knew the danger that was in Judea. You see, where Bethany was was only two miles from where he would actually die and where he would be arrested. And so Thomas knew that there was danger in Judea, and Thomas says, let us go that we may die with him. Now, Thomas actually did, the, the story says that he ended up being a martyr for Christ. And all disciples following Jesus are ultimately choosing death in this life, but eternal life forever. So Thomas says, let us go that we may die with them. That's where it says, take up his cross daily. Well, then Jesus and his disciples go back, verse 17 through 20, and Jesus finds out that Lazarus has been dead four stinking days. Four days he's dead. Then uh, Mary, Martha comes out, and Martha comes go, come into Jesus, and he said, Lord, if you had been here my brother would not have died. That's real. She wasn't hiding it. For, for those of you who are going through tough, tough circumstances, for those of you who have lost loved ones, you don't need to hide your hurt, your pain from God. You don't need to hide your questions. You can bring your questions to Jesus because he can answer them. And, he, and Jesus does answer him. He says, your brother will rise again. Martha says, I know he will rise again on the last day. Then you got verse 25. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus says, I am. This is that ego a me, that phrase that we've been seeing throughout the book of John. This is now the seventh one. He first said, I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the light of the world. I am before Abraham was, I am. He said, I am the door. I am the shepherd. And now he's saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Everyone needs resurrection. Everyone will die, but in Jesus, he is the resurrection power. He's not only resurrection, but he's life. He's the giver of life. He's the sustainer of life. He is the fullness of life, as John 10.10 10 says. He is the fullness of life. And it's not theories or practices that bring you resurrection. This is a person. Jesus and Jesus alone is the resurrection and the life. And then he says this statement in verse 20, 26. Everyone who believes, everyone. People say Christians are exclusive. No way. Christians are the most open hands. Jesus said anyone. You don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to act a certain way. Anyone. No matter what your past is, I don't care what your past is, anyone who believes, this word believe is mentioned 99 times in the book of John. John is urging people to believe. In fact, it can be argued that John is really leading people to believe. John 20, verse 31, you can write that off to the side, John 20, 31 John says, these are written, what is the purpose? So that you may believe that Jesus is what? The Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Jesus says, whoever believes, anyone who believes, what does this word believe mean? Believe is like trust. Believe is trust. It's not just 
believing in your head. It's not a theoretical thing, although it, it does start there, right? But believe is a whole submission in your life. It's a full-out trust. Now, I love uh, swimming in the summer. Who likes to go for a dip, cool off, swim? One of my favorites is, though, is swimming with my kids. I just love Hannah, Samuel, and Joel and uh, their cousins. Boy, the laughter in water. There's nothing like it. It's awesome. But my favorite is Joel right now. He's almost two years old. In two weeks, he'll be two, which is awesome. Uh, but Joel is just figuring out the water, and he will come up to the edge of the asphalt, and I'll say, Joel, Joel, jump, jump, and he just stands there, and, and he's kind of leaning out, but he can't quite get there yet, and I'll, I'll get his brother, and he'll jump in, and I'll catch him, and I'll say, see, see, Joel, Sammy did it. And then he'll just get up to the edge of the diving board and kind of lean out. And then sometimes he kind of puts his hands out and he just wants me to hold him and pull him in. Belief, belief in Jesus is an all-out jump into his arms. It's a, I trust you, Jesus. And so Jesus is saying, whoever believes in me, belief, trust in him. Whoever believes may live and will not, even though he dies. Jesus says, whoever believes in me, though he dies, every one of us will die, yet shall he live. And then verse 26, he repeats himself. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Say that with me, shall never die. Say, shall never die. Those who believe in Jesus will not die. That is the reality. Those who believe in Jesus go from life here on earth, which gets you little glimpses of goodness and joy, but then you go to heaven and it's eternal life and joy. It's incredible. You will never die. I am convinced that if every believer lived with this truth, with this reality, that they will never die, that we would live life a lot differently. Just think about that. Receive that. Say, I will never die. Those who believe in Jesus will never die. And those, those, that statement grips me in two ways. One, I live this life differently. I live this life knowing that all the stuff that I seem to care about really doesn't matter. Because this life is short compared to eternity. And then two, it grips me because I know that there are many people like here in this vase, their names, they have not yet believed. And I want to go after them and I want to tell them. And so Jesus asks Martha this incredible question and he says to her, do you believe? Do you believe? And this is the most important question you can ask yourself, and you can ask your neighbor, and you can ask these 3,000 homes all around us. Do you believe? Because everyone will die, and they will be asked this question. Do you believe? Have you jumped? Have you gone all in? Do you believe? We need to ask people this question, and I ask you today, have you believed? And if you do believe, have you asked your neighbor? Have you asked your children, your grandchildren? Do you believe? Well, Martha replies in an awesome way. She says, I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. This statement is so similar to Peter uh, in Matthew 16. It's repeated at the end of John. You are the Christ. This is what everybody must answer. Do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world? Martha replied, yes, I believe. And she did this before she saw Lazarus get raised from the dead. 
it goes on and and she she said that she said yes so then Martha goes back and she gets Mary and Mary comes and she falls out at the feet of Jesus and Mary says Lord if you had been here my brother would not have died again just being real sometimes there's questions sometimes it's not easy to believe there's hard things that happen to all of us and it's not always easy to believe Mary was real with it well then Jesus, this is amazing. Jesus responds with deep emotion. It says in verse 33, he was deeply moved. He was greatly troubled. Then Jesus asks where Lazarus is, verse 35. It says Jesus weeps. This is an amazing reality. God weeps. There's no other religion where God weeps. Nothing. No matter what hardship you are going through, Jesus can identify with your hardship. No matter what questions you have, God's not saying, oh, come back to me when you stop crying. God doesn't say that. God says, bring those tears to me. I'll I'll weep with you. This is where I love Isaiah 53. He carries our sorrows. It says he's a man of sorrows. What an amazing God we have. He can identify with our pain and our hurt. And so he does. He's moved with great compassion. And then the outsiders, those around the edge in verse 36, they say, see how he loved him. Again, God's love is not dependent upon our circumstances. In death or life, God's love is constant. He loves us at all times. And so they saw his love even before Lazarus was raised from the dead. Well, Jesus didn't just say it or declare it or moved with emotion, then he's moved to powerful action. It says in verse 38, he was moved again. And it says, take away the stone. And then uh, Mary and Martha, they go, well, there's going to be an odor because he's dead for four days. It's going to stink. Well, Jesus says, did I not say to you, this is for the glory of God at all times, glory. Then verse 41 Jesus prays. This is an amazing prayer. I won't get into it. But he just says, Father, Father. He wanted people to know his Father. And look at the end of verse 42. Why does he pray? It's for people standing around that they may believe. Everybody, he wants you to believe that Jesus sent him. Well, then verse 43, he says, Lazarus, come out. Hallelujah. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Jesus declares, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus did. He responded. He had grave clothes on. Jesus said, oh, I don't want you looking like toilet paper uh, all around you. He said, get those things off of you. And, And Lazarus was alive. Well, then look at verse 45. It says, many people did what? Many people believed. They saw. Now, let me just say, this action was a prophetic act that there would be a bodily resurrection, that Jesus himself would die, fully die, his heart stopped beating, and that Jesus himself would be a bodily resurrection, and he let people put his hands in in his wounds, and he appeared to many, and so too, Everybody who believes in Jesus, though you die, there will be a bodily resurrection, which is different than other religions. Some religions, they believe that there's just a spiritual resurrection. No, there's a bodily resurrection. And this is a prophetic act because actually Lazarus will die again. But here's what grips me in verse 46. There's others who don't believe. Some believe, some don't believe. They both saw the same act. They saw Lazarus come out. And you can think, oh, if I saw that, I would believe. There were people who saw it and still did not believe. And they plotted to kill Jesus and Lazarus. They wanted to kill 
Jesus and Lazarus in John chapter 12. We'll get into that next week. But they, they plot to kill Lazarus again. Why? Because so many people were believing in Jesus. So today, would you believe for anyone who is not sure that when they die, they will live? I call you to believe, to believe in Jesus, to go all in. Get baptized. We got water up here. When in Acts chapter 2, the disciples, it says that the people were cut to the heart and they asked, what must we do to be saved? The disciple Peter said, believe and be baptized. Go all in. Baptism is an expression of something that has gone on in your heart. Believe. Give glory to God. Know that God can be glorified at all times and that Jesus loves you in every circumstance, that he's ready to meet with you. So let's stand. I'd like the worship team to come forward. And if anyone here today would like to believe in Jesus, I want to invite you to come forward. If you are not sure if you were to die, if you would live, if you would go from life to life eternal, I want you to come forward. I want you to talk with me or talk with one of the leaders that is going to be up here. 1 John 5.13 says, I write these things to you who believe in me, that you may know you have eternal life. You don't need to doubt. You don't need to wonder, oh, if I drive out of here and I get hit by a car, what's going to happen to me? You don't have to wonder that. You can know for certain that when you die, you will live. That yet, you will never die. Hallelujah. Come forward and talk to one of us. Let's, let's believe in Jesus. Let's respond to Jesus in this call to believe afresh in him.